dog roll in the mud. You know, I don't want to dress. I want my pants on. I'm going to be a, I wanted to be a guy, actually. You know, they had more fun. They didn't ask. It sees the other person not as a god or an idol, but as a human being possessing the strength and weaknesses of all human beings. Love does not ask to be served, but only when it may serve. Quiet, gentle, trusting, it is composed of affection and desire without anxiety. I knew I did not have a clue of what love was. I had never had anything like that. And uh, I went home and I told J.D., I don't love you. He said, oh. (laughs) And I said, no, I've never loved anyone or anything according to that definition. I said, I've I've never had that kind of uh, feeling about anything. And he said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well... He says, do you you want a divorce? What what do you want? And I said, no, I don't think I want a divorce since I've already got you. I figure that if I got somebody else, I'd be just as screwed up anyway. So I'll try and learn how to love you since I already have you here. And we'll see how it goes. (laughs) Now, we laugh now, but I was very serious at the time. I was very, very serious because I didn't know. And uh, about a year or so after that, it occurred to me one night that I had begun to respect J.D. And that that was on the way to love, you know, to love that. But I had begun, I did no longer look at him as a piece of damaged goods, as the bad little boy who had done all those horrible things. The forgiveness process had begun to work, and I was being able to put the past in the past somewhat, and I could have some respect and love or compassion for J.D. You know, and that's when I began to see a little by little that I was accepting him as he was, and I was trying to be a little more tender, a little less vicious. Um, I didn't want to be with him all the time, attached at the hip. I had to be attached at the hip so I could watch him before. Now I didn't have to do that. And uh, I could do stuff a little more for free. Instead of having to charge him for loving him, you know, that kind of thing. So today I have to say to myself, but what is God's love to me? This is what I want to transmit in a relationship, is an expression of God's love. But what is God's love to me? And God's love to me is unconditional. It's very comforting. It's protective. It's kind, forgiving. It's strong, yet gentle. It's trustworthy. You can always depend on it. It's constant, never wavers. It enhances anything and everything I have anything to do with. It's happy, joyous, and free. It's all wise, all powerful. It's whatever I need it to be at any point in time. That's what God's love is. It is anything or everything I need. And uh, I've learned, if anything, that God loves us so much. He doesn't give us a lot of things we ask for because they're not good for us. God will not do anything that is harmful to you. But God will not keep you from doing anything you have to do. You know, and God always goes ahead of us and plans in love. He's always going ahead. So we don't have to worry about the future because he's going ahead planning in love. Now, when God's love is removed, relationships die. Because it talks about it in the big book. It says that, you know, it's like a tornado. It's that self-will run right. It just goes whippy, whippy, whippy. You know, we just go through life. And I had behind me a trail of debris of relationships when I got here. It was debris. There was a lot of stuff back there. But by having only one primary purpose here, which is to be an expression of God's love, I can focus on that, expressing what God's love or God's will is. And, you know, we used to get into these great big deep discussions about what God's will is. You know, I don't always know what God's will is, but I know what God's will isn't. God's will isn't for me to be like I used to be. God's will isn't for me to be dishonest. It isn't for me to practice character defects. You know, if I try to do the best I can and not doing the things that I used to do, you just got to get in here and do everything different, you know. It's just that simple. You know, what part do you need to change? Well, everything, you know. But if I'm doing all of those things, 
and I'm not, if I'm doing what I think God would have me do and not doing my defects on a regular basis, then I might somewhere be in the ballpark of God's will for me. It's not what I want so much is what God wants for me. God wants for me more than I can ever dream about wanting for me. You know, when you take your biggest dream and put it out there, God has a dream that's bigger and better than anything you could imagine. Because if you got just what you dreamed for, wouldn't you have been shortchanged here? You know? You would have been shortchanged because you've received so much more than what you ever thought. Because, see, I based what I got on what I felt I was worth. And when your self-worth is low, you are really ready to accept crumbs instead of the piece of cake. You know, that's the reason so many of I used to love Winnie's thing, you know, about you need to take the first piece of cake. And I never could do that for years because I wasn't worthy of the first piece of cake. Another thing that I've learned here in expressing God's love is if you can ask God, pray and ask God to let you see these people as well as yourself through His eyes. God looks at us so differently than we look at ourselves or at others. You know, I don't believe that God looks at you and says, well, that's my shitty kid for today. You know, I just don't think God does that. I think God looks at us and sometimes and says, gosh, you could really be enjoying life if you didn't have to do that. You know, that kind of thing. But um, where I first was able to do this was I prayed and I prayed and I prayed about my relationship with my mother because it was the worst relationship. You know, I may have tried to kill J.D., but I killed my mother time after time after time. And it was uh, a really an insidious thing. And the way I did it, I didn't know I was doing it. Now, I dreamed of choking her to death. I dreamed of doing lots of wicked things to her, thinking that would hurt her for not loving me. Because that's what I perceived, that my mother didn't love me. But the only problem with that was, I hurt her in so many ways by my attitude, my rebelliousness. You see, my mother was left a widow with a kid who was unmanageable. And she was frightened. She had never been, you know, I mean, my daddy had been there for her since she was 16 years old. And she was terrified. What do you do? And you've got a kid that will not mind you in any way, shape, or form, and who delights in doing the very opposite of what you tell a child to do. I'm the kind of kid I would have killed had I had one. You know, I would have been the poster for birth control. You know, I mean, really. A little poster child for birth control. You don't want one like this. And so many times I rejected her. And you see, every time I would go to my mother, I would go as a child. I would go over there looking for that approval, which I would have called love. And not receiving approval, I perceived my mother didn't love me. And so I got even with her for not loving me. It was a real, real sick relationship. And I wanted my mother to change. I wanted my mother to be different. My mother's not the kind of mother I want. That was my little song and dance number. And until I could accept what I had, nothing could change. Mama didn't change, but I changed. And so I began to pray that prayer. And I prayed that prayer for several years, seeing no results. But just because you don't see it doesn't mean God's not working on it. You know, because our time frame, like I say, is so different than God's time frame. And then um, I had to realize that I had put Daddy on a pedestal and made him perfect. And then I compared her against Mr. Perfect, so she had no chance. You know, those kind of things. And I had to realize my Daddy was not perfect. He was sort of passive-aggressive. And uh, he used me to get at her a lot of times. I could see that, you know, much, much later, you know, because when Daddy died, I was 12 years old, and I made him a saint. An absolute saint in my life. And I began to see some of this, you know. And I didn't like seeing it. It was very, very painful to see reality. But as time went on, I went over to my mother's one day. And uh, Mama asked me, she said, uh, well, first of all, when I asked God, I was praying for to be able to see her like he saw her. And so one day I went and drove over to my mother's. And as I drove in the driveway that day, she was way out in the back and she was raking leaves. And uh, she was very, very short. I didn't know she was short. Why wouldn't I not know my mother was short? My mother only came out to hear on me. 
Because if you always come as a child, your mama's big. I came as a child forever, wanting from her. Never once did I come to her wanting to give something. I came to take. And it was so clear to me that day when I saw her back there. You know, I was a child. I was a child. And I was still in that little kid thing. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give gimme give approval and then I can be okay. And that had never worked. That was not going to work. And it was just amazing to me that I didn't know she was short. But see, that just began to show me how much I thought I knew that I didn't know. You know, when you know no one can teach you anything, it's when you don't know that you can be taught. And so, as I walked back to see her, it was almost like I could see her heart. And in this heart were many scars. There was not a tremendous abundance of love that she was withholding from me. And see, all my life I felt like she punished me by withholding her love because I didn't do the way she wanted. You know, she would tell me things like she wanted such a feminine little girl. Well, I was a tomboy. And she would be so disappointed. You know, she'd put a dress on me. I'd run out and I'd be like a dog rolling the mud. You know, I don't want a dress. I want my pants on. I'm going to be a, I wanted to be a guy actually. You know, they had more fun. They didn't have so many rules and things. I wanted to be like my dad, you know. And so here was mother wanting this sweet little feminine thing. Wasn't going to happen here, you know. And so we punished each other this way. But I thought she doesn't love me because I'm not the way she wants me to be. And you know why? I didn't love her because she wasn't the way I wanted her to be. Anything you want for someone else from them, you've got to be willing to put that forth. Because what goes round comes round. And see, we want to get it before we give it. You know, you got to take the action and then it becomes. And so anyway, as I saw her heart, you know, I saw that if anybody was going to bring love to that relationship, <laughs> sort of like the old joke, if you only the hog left in the pen, hog you it. You know, I'm going to have to bring it to her because she doesn't have it to give. And my God, I never knew that. And so I go back there, and I mean, I am just devastated by all this, you know, how this just, whoo, that moment of clarity, you know, whoo. And I, I said, Mama, put your leaf broom down. She was raking. And I put my arms around her, and I held her, and I gave her a hug. And boy, was she stiff. Because we don't talk, we don't hug, we don't do anything like that. Never had. But I needed to do that for me. And you know, consistently when I would go to see her, I would give her that hug, whether I felt like it or not. You know, the thing of it is being consistent. And I consistently gave her that hug. And when I would do that, Mama didn't hug back, but it got to where she would stand up for it. She would lean into it. You could tell she wanted it, but she just wasn't free enough to do it back. You know, that kind of a thing. Well... After another period of time went by, one day I went over there to visit Mama, and she said, I want to ask you about something that happened when your daddy died. And I said, well, this is how I remember it. And she said, well, I don't remember it that way. And I thought, oop, here we go, because that's the way our deal usually went. You know, we argued all the time. And uh, she said, but you were 12 years old, and I was almost 60. We would have seen this a lot different. And I thought, Wow. That's really something for mother, you know. Because, see, you know, I never gave mother credit for having any sense either. You know how kids are. They think their mothers are stupid. I never outgrew that, you know. I was a perpetual teenager. Emotional retard, you know. When we got to talking about it, she said, there's nothing I've never understood about you. She said, why were you such an ornery kid? And I said, well, that's pretty simple. I was ornery because I was getting even with you for not loving me. I just told her the truth. And she looked so stunned and she said, not love you? How could I? She said, I gave you a roof over your head. I gave you food to eat. I gave you clothes to wear. She said it was more than I ever had. You see, my mother had been raised in alcoholism. Her mother and father both alcoholic. Her father was extremely physical abusive. And she had scars all over her body where he would get mad and cut her up with a knife and do different things to her. And when she was between 12 and 13, he came in one night drunk and tried to rape her. And so she'd picked up a stick of stove wood, hit him in the head and ran away from home. 
Now, it wasn't fashionable to be a runaway on the streets in the early 1900s. And she lived in a little alleyway in Memphis. And that was hundreds of miles that she walked to get there, to get to safety, to get so far away no one would know who she was or send her back or what have you to that hell that she was living in. And there was, she was in this alleyway, and there was a boarding house right next door. And the lady who owned the boarding house was pregnant. And she went out and told my mother that if she would come help her in the boarding house, she'd give her room and board. And so that's how my mother survived. And my father was the head of the recruiting office in Memphis, Tennessee for the Army. And he took his meals at that boarding house. And that was how they met. She was waiting tables in the boarding house. And when she turned 16, they got married. You know? Now, if you'd had to live like that, never knowing if you were going to have something to eat, any clothes to wear, and not having a roof over your head, what would be the greatest thing that you could ever provide a child? She gave the very best of what she thought. And see, I thought that parents owed you that. Huh? You know, I forget. Alcoholism is out there. You know? Alcoholism had robbed her of all of those things. And so she was giving the very best she had. And so that day, it's like it all came together and it all became enough. It became enough for me. You know, that hole in me wasn't there like it had been. And my mama looked at me and she said, You know, baby, I love you. I've always loved you. My mother had never said it before. And she walked over and put her arms around me and gave me the hug this time. You know, that hole inside me closed up. You know, because if I had, I had consistently tried to do what people told me to do, I acted like a kind and loving daughter. I didn't know how to be a kind and loving daughter. I went to people that had good relationships with their mothers. There are some, you know. And they're not the unfortunates, you know. But there are some that have that. And I'd say, what do you do? You know, tell me, what do you do? You know, and they said, treat her like a kind and loving daughter. Give her gifts, gifts of time. Spend some time with her. And that was hard. And when I would find the need to have to tell her, I'd have to go. When she'd call on the phone, you know, my mother lived alone from the time I was 19. And, and Mama died when she was 89. So she'd been alone. Now, if you live alone, you just talk all the time. Because you're so starved to be with someone. I don't know what my excuse is. But... <laughs> But that, but she would. She'd want to tell you what she had for breakfast. What she, you know, she was sharing what she had in her day. And and so many times I would just ignore her and lay the phone down and then pick it up and go, uh huh, yeah, and lay the phone down, uh huh, yeah. You know, I began to listen to what she had to say. You know, it might have been, but that was her day. That was her life. She was sharing what she had to share with me. I gave her the gift of acceptance, accepting her as she was, not asking her to be. What she wasn't. Because every time I did, every time I would accept her as she was, you know, we'd get along a lot better. My mother's major complaint was I was always trying to change her. I'd say, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to help you. (laughs) And what does that translate to? I'm trying to change her. You know, I tried to bring her into the century. I tried, I got her the microwave. She wouldn't use the microwave. She was afraid that the, you know, little things in outer space, you know, it was just, mm, no, no, not using the microwave. You know, I would try to get her a various and sundry things and modernize her home. You know, I had Eric's central air, not central, the window units. When I got central air, I took my window units. And uh, she had me come and take them out. She didn't like her house shut up. She's like, fresh air, thank you very much. Fresh air in Arkansas in August is 110 on a good day. <laughs> she wanted fresh air, you know. But that was the thing. I kept trying to make that what I called making it easier, but that wasn't in leaving her alone, letting her do it her way was the kind and loving thing to do. Being an expression of God's love is not doing something for someone that they need to do and can do for themselves. So many times we cripple people by doing for them what they need to do for themselves. And the funny thing about that is when you do and you do and you do for people, after a while you resent doing for people. And that's no longer any kind of gift of love. It's it's no longer free. You know, it says we give comfort and understanding to our loved ones. And what does that mean? A little praise, some positive strokes, praying for them, maybe not centering in on their defects, but encouraging them through their positives. 
And that takes a lot of effort because we have a tendency to look at that negative, just yip, just open your eyes in the morning. I don't know about y'all, I am not a normal morning perky person. And I have problems with morning perky people. You know, it's like the other morning, J.D. got up and, and I told him, how he was just, da 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 and I said, uh, J.D., uh, honey, uh, quiet, please. And so he just, oh, but did he? and I said, uh, J.D., J.D., and he said, what? And I said, uh, shut up. And he said, oh. And then in a few seconds, he went, I said, J.D., you want I should kill you this morning? You know, and he's going, what? And I said, I just need some quiet. And he goes, I forget, because he's a person that when he wakes up, you know, he's Mr. Perky. And the worst thing in the world is getting on an airplane at 6 in the morning with a perky flight attendant. You know, I've had that horror. You know, you get on and they go, morning, you know, and your eyes just sort of ricochet in your head. I can't handle that, you know. But I found that when I praise J.D. on the good stuff and everything, that he responds so much differently to me, you know. And when I look for the positives. And, uh, you know, I tell him, you know, you look nice. And I write him little notes and, and put them in sometimes in his lunchbox. You know, and I did that for my first husband. He did not appreciate that. But that was when the magic markers first came out. And remember, this is a man that I'm getting, <laughs> that I'm living with, but I don't love. And I'm really angry about it. And so, uh, I would write little messages on his eggs, uh, his hard boiled eggs. And, uh, he got to where he said he was afraid to open his lunch around other people. You know, he's because here he was, the sergeant in charge, and the, the troops were losing a little respect for him because of the messages on his hardball days. Um, you know, just stuff like that. Okay. Um, I have learned, too, to, uh, and I, I'm not a coffee drinker, but I make sure J.D. has coffee for the mornings, you know, just little things. Uh I try not to be tacky when he wants to do an all-day Clint Eastwood. You know, I, I read a lot. But I'm in there with him. You know, there's something about it. You know, he likes to have me in there with him when he's watching television. Not that he's going to talk to me or anything, you know. But he just sort of wants you living and breathing there with him. And it's like, okay, I can do that for a while, you know. And one of the hardest and most was being kind to him when he's sick. You know, you know how men are when they don't feel good? I don't know about yours, but mine gets awfully whiny. They get very, very needy, you know, I mean, and it's just like, oh, die and get it over with. You know, <laughs> now, but, you know, it's real funny. Don't expect them to do anything, right? Now, when you're sick, what do you do? You cook, you clean, you do the deal, you know, and you martyr. <laughs> you martyr really, really well, you know. There's just a lot of those little differences that's always amazed me. One of, one of the mysteries of my life that maybe somebody can know the answer to someday is what is it that men do to their underwear that once they take them off, they can't touch them again? <laughs> you ever notice how they leave them laying somewhere and, and they don't touch them again? <laughs> I always wonder about that, you know. <laughs> but... What I've noticed over the the last few years especially is there's been a new intimacy between J.D. and me. There's a, a much, and uh, I like say, especially this last couple of years, there's a closeness that um, it's just really hard to define. It's like um, when we're like when we're sitting on the couch together and all of a sudden it's just that touch. It's that little special touch or that, like somebody made the observation today that we were walking down the hall holding hands. We do that a lot, you know, and it's like, it's comforting and it's, it's kind, and it's loving, you know, it's just an expression of, I'm here and I care. And we're closer now and we do more things together than we've ever done. And used to, if you'd have told me, I would have said, that, I'd say, oh, that's hokey or that's this or that. Let me tell you, it feels pretty darn good. It's very, very good. Uh, did you ever think about people maybe doing the very best they can and they need compassion and forgiveness, not judgment? You know, so many times I have a tendency to judge another person's actions instead of being kind, forgiving, and what have you. Realizing that sometimes on, I'm doing the very best I can and I'm still being an asshole. And that's the best I can be for that moment in time for where I'm at. I don't like being there any more than you like me being there. But that's where I'm at. 
You know, my sponsor used to get on to me because the first five years, every time I'd do an inventory, uh, extremely judgmental and critical was one of the very glaring defects. And she said, you ever wonder why there's never any improvement here? I said, yeah, I have. She says, because you've never been willing to let go of it. And I said, well, even the Bible says that you have the right to do that. It says that we can be a fruit, you know, a tree is known by its fruit. And I reserve the right to be a fruit inspector. <laughs> okay. She said, there's another little verse that says, judge not lest you be judged. And you know, I used to think that meant that you would judge me. You're not the hard judge. I judge me. My standard for judging me is a hundred times harder than it is in me judging you. I judge myself. And when I do that, I pass it on to you. And the more I don't like about me and I see it in you, the harder I judge you. You know? So she gave me a little poem. It says, Has God deserted heaven and left it up to you to decide what people really should or shouldn't do? No, he's still in business and he knows when to wield a rod. So remember when you're judging, remember you're not God. And you know, as you know, I still have that with me. <laughs> you know, if, if you had to keep it on your refrigerator five years, you would too. Um, <laughs> she wanted to put it in a place where I'd have my attention there. <laughs> Love and forgiveness are qualities of a power greater than me. You know, and when you can't give yourself the right to make mistakes and forgive yourself, you certainly won't be able to pass that on. And, you know, forgiveness is such a simple thing. All it is is giving someone a chance to do better. Just give them a chance to do different. Give them a chance to do better. Okay, so maybe they blow it again. But you will have feel better about yourself. When you can do that. When you can forgive. You know, you're supposed to keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. And you know, I found that the hardest person in the world to forgive is me. You know, how many times do you have to say I'm sorry when you do something and it's really bad, you know? Does just one I'm sorry seem to cover it? It does, but you know, with us, we have to just keep going back and going back and going back. Because, see, we don't accept the forgiveness. And that's the way I was. You know, I couldn't accept even my own forgiveness. You know, the moment you ask God for forgiveness, God gives you forgiveness. And He forgives to the point He doesn't bring it up again. But I was bad about going back and bringing stuff up again. And that would tell me I hadn't really forgiven because if I've forgiven, it's gone away. And if I have to keep coming back and beating you with the same old stick, then all I've done has just put it on the shelf until the next little time comes along and then I can whip, whip, whip you again with it, you know. So, I have to learn to expect less of people I love. Allow them, you know, to be themselves. Allow them the dignity to fail. Allow them the dignity to fail in doing things. Say, like, you know how to do it and they don't ask you. You know, we're real good about volunteering information. <laughs> if they don't ask, let them find out. They'll learn better because... You know, J.D. has a tendency whenever I have to tell him something, I feel like I have to tell him. He doesn't do it because I told him. You know, he'll go against his own best judgment, and so will I when I think somebody's trying to tell me what to do. You know, we rebel at stuff like that. I've had to, uh, I've had a real hard time this year, this past year, and J.D. has too. You know, J.D., when the deal happened with my sister, J.D. lost his running buddy. As you know, I travel a lot. And J.D. would stay home and be with Dorothy and take care of her. And Dorothy, as he knew her, is gone forever. And so he lost his best companion. And then, when this past year, when we lost both of our babies at 16 and 16 and a half, you know, it's been very difficult. And to watch him grieve has been extremely difficult. You know, we have our little pet cemetery out at the back. And, and I look out the back window and J.D.'s sitting out there by the water garden on the little bench. And he's crying. He's, he's out there grieving his dogs, you know. But I have to give him the right to deal with his grief in his own way. And yes, it's painful to see someone you love hurt. But I can't fix it. I can't fix it, you know. And um, I told him, you know, uh, he says, you know, he finds himself talking to himself when I'm gone because he was used to talking to the dogs. I don't have an excuse. I talk to myself at work. I talk to myself everywhere, you know. We talked about it, and we decided that we would uh, probably get more dogs. And um, 
I went to uh, Ontario, Canada back in the spring, and I found a, a breeder up there. And so sometime this fall, we should have new babies. So that will be good, too. Uh, I found that another way to show God's love to the people out there is to be nice. <laughs> what a concept. You know, I used to be the world's worst hostile grocery store person. I would go into a store. I don't like being in the store. It takes too much of my time to go buy groceries. It takes too much effort. You gotta, and there's always somebody with 15 or 16 items in the tin line or whatever, you know, there's always that. The prices go up every time you go in the door, the darn prices are up again, and it's just irritating and annoying, and it's been that way all my life. I just hated it. And so I was not nice. To the point, I couldn't get people to check me out. When it would come my time to check out, the checkers would go on break, have to pee or something. And so I'd usually have to get the store manager to check me out. I mean, it was it was amazing. And uh, so I got tired of that. I got tired of that. And my sponsor told me, she said, well, you need to be different. You need to change where that's concerned. She said, you know, we become a walking, living, breathing example of the program. You know, we're not an authority, but we become an example. And she says, we change our behavior and we act differently. So I go, okay, okay. She said, you go to the store and you act differently. Now, all right, pendulum, right? You know, vicious person, flaming nut. Okay, I go right over here. I'm skipping down the aisles behind my cart, you know, at the Skag Albertson store. We had Skaggs Albertsons back then. And I am skipping down the aisle of my cart. And I'm going, da-da, da-da, I'm buying groceries. God, I love to buy groceries. And I'm doing this for myself. You know, I'm trying to get myself through the store. I get to the check. Well, you know, it took them a while before they felt safe to check me out. But anyway, I finally got them to where they were checking me out. And even the sack boys weren't afraid to take my groceries to the car. And we're having a big time. And then uh, one day I, I came in there and the, the checkout girl said, I really like your eye makeup. That's really different. And I'm thinking, it is? I wonder what's different about it. And I get out to my car and I look in the mirror and I have one blue eye and one green eye. I don't know what happened that morning. <laughs> Made her day though. You know, I'm, okay, we're moving along, you know, in time. And it came around Christmas time that year. And I got home and I was unloading my groceries one day and I had a card in my groceries. And I went, oh my God, I've shoplifted. You know, I have shoplifted a card. I don't remember getting a card. And I opened it, and it was from the checkers and the sackers. And they were thanking me for being their most favorite customer. They said, we always have so much fun. You know, I still have that card. And that little sacker, he grew up, and he became a store manager. And this past year, though, he has uh, Hodgkin's disease. And uh, But he's a, he's a tremendous, loving little man. And... Uh, He's just been a real sweetie to me for years and years. Uh, but that was a relationship, you know, that I wouldn't have had. Wouldn't have had if I'd have stayed the way I was. And uh, they just love it. Uh, they got a new store manager in one day, and he was really a pain. And they uh, asked me if I would uh, play with him. And I said, <laughs> and it was real funny because I had bought some always pads. And as they were coming through, instead of being two forty nine a box, all of a sudden it went up four twenty nine. And I thought, well, it's a transposition thing in the way they scanned it or something. And uh, she says, "Oh, call Mister So and So." She says it'll terrorize him. And so I said, "Okay, I'm game." And so we called him over, and I explained to him that this has been two forty nine for weeks and weeks, and now it's four twenty nine. He says, "Well, sometimes we change the prices on items. Uh, we lower them considerably to people to get used to a new item, and then." Oh, really? And then we, and then we, uh, increase it to its regular price. In other words, you jack the price up once you get us hung up on it. And he, uh, well, yes. And I said, well, I want to know, is this a sexist price change? And he said, uh, I beg your pardon? I said, well, did condoms go up? <laughs> he said, give it to her at the other price. <laughs> You know, and then I've learned too to to practice that 
courtesy and the sense of humor, which is all part of God's love. I've learned to do that on the road with my driving. And this past summer, you know, it was really, really hot in Arkansas. Really, really hot. And when it's hot like that, tempers on the road, the people driving seems to get a little more vicious, you know. And there were several people that I recognized I was going to have to kill. And um, I told J.D., I said, my attitude's really getting ratty about that. I'm going to have to do something different. And that's when it occurred to me, I could really have some fun here. And uh, so I got my broken hair dryer, and I cut the cord off of it, and I carry it in my console. And when I come up to people, and I say, my car is a 92 Chevrolet Caprice Classic, and it looks just like the police cars. And so when I come up and people irritate me, I pick up my radar gun and I go beep, 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 with my hair dryer. Beep, 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 beep. I've had people pull over. It is hysterical. <laughs> I even radar the cops as I go past. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Cora says there's not a law against the, the, the hair dryer. <laughs> and she would know. She would know. Cora tried to administer, um, sobriety, a field sobriety test to me out in front of the Cracker Barrel restaurant and I failed it. <laughs> Cold sober and there were people coming in and they are going, did you see that? That woman's having to do a sobriety test out there. <laughs> Fun, fun, fun. And I have gratitude for the world I'm in. I try to be a better neighbor. I try to be a better citizen in my community, you know. And I know today, which I didn't before, that my spiritual needs cannot be met by another person. My spiritual needs. God has to do this for me because God loves me. And when that's in charge, then my life is better. And I don't trouble people to make me happy, you know. I think some people are happy being miserable. It just sort of looks that way. And I used to be one of them, you know. And I use God's love instead of sex with a relationship. Used to when I'd start a relationship. It started with sex and went downhill, you know. And if you start with God's love, it'll go uphill every time. Tradition six. A partner ought not be overly supportive spiritually, emotionally, or physically to the marriage or relationship lest problems of ego gratification divert him or her from the primary purpose. This is where you learn to be a caregiver instead of a caretaker. You know, there's a world of difference. And uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know how to do that. I took care of you to the point you couldn't even care for yourself. I would take over, just come in and take over. But I've learned, especially in watching Dorothy's caregiver dealing with her in the last year, she allows Dorothy to do everything Dorothy can. She only does for Dorothy what Dorothy cannot do. You know, like for instance, Dorothy can get up and she can dress herself and sometimes she remembers to comb her hair and if she doesn't, then she reminds her. You know, Dorothy can take her insulin shots, but she just can't put the insulin in and she doesn't know when she's taken one and when she hasn't, so she has a tendency to want to take more or not take any. So she manages the medication for Dorothy. You know, those kind of things. Because now you cannot control Dorothy. There's a difference in all of that. And so that's what I needed to learn, how to be a caregiver rather than a caretaker. Now, my need and my uh, my need to be needed and my self-esteem was based on helping other people all my life. A uh, little girlfriend I had named Shirley. Shirley, I used to do all of Shirley's homework. I mean, from the time we were in grade school, I would do Shirley's homework, you know. And Shirley would say, well, she wasn't very good in school. And so when we got in junior high school, Shirley went and had her eyes checked. Shirley was blind. She was so nearsighted, she started with Coke bottle glasses. You know, back then, they didn't have tests in school for your eyes and stuff like they do more now. And so Shirley didn't know. And her family, you know, like in most families, we didn't go to the doctor unless you had something wrong with you. You didn't have preventive. You didn't go to the dentist unless you had a toothache and that kind of thing. And so when Shirley got her glasses, guess what? Shirley could see and then Shirley didn't need me. You know? It was a little identity thing there. You know, she didn't need me to do her homework for her anymore. And I felt like Shirley wasn't as much my friend because, see, I liked her depending on me. See, if they need you, they'll keep you longer. You know, that was my philosophy. And I used to do this in my workplace. Do more and more and more. You know, do this person's job, help this person out, do all this stuff, be the overachiever, work yourself to death, and then feel overburdened. 
you know, feel put upon, you know. I've got so much to do. Everybody at work always comes to me to get crap done. Why? Because you do it. That's why we teach people how to treat us by what we do. And that made me feel like I was worth more. And you know, when I left that company, they lasted for another year or two. (laughs) You know. And then, see, but that's a perfect breeding ground for the alcoholism. Because the more they drink, the less they do. The less they do, the more we do. We're slack taker-uppers. You know, we keep taking up the slack. And they don't do this, and we do more of that over there. You know, the more he drinks, the more I control. The more things there is to do. And, you know, it was fine. You know, because when they're drinking, they don't want you to have to have any responsibility, don't want to have to do anything. Just leave them alone, let them drink, you know. And so I could not leave him alone, but I did all those things. You know, I said, you know, if I'd have taken another job, he wouldn't have had to even make an attempt at working, you know, because the more that he drank, the less he worked. The less he was physically able to work, the more he drank. And there was another thing. If he didn't need me, he might not want me. Because, see, that's how I did mine. I dressed him. We had this mother-child relationship. I would dress him, you know. I would take care of the all of the finances. I did everything in the house. You know, I bought the groceries, cooked the... J.D. can now cook a few items, you know. If you like hot dogs for breakfast, you got it made. Um, <laughs> But I didn't give him credit for having any sense because I did all this stuff for him, you know. I would think, you know, he was less than because he couldn't do these things, but it was the things that I was doing, you know. And uh, that's just like I would tell him, you know, J.D., there's a bad weather forecast, and uh, he was working nights, and so I said, we're supposed to have ice and snow overnight. Now, that's information, but I couldn't shut up there. And I would have to tell him what to do with the information, And I'd say, so you need to put some extra weight in the back of the truck over the axles. (laughs) But I would have to tell him what to do with the information. So he came home and he said, I slid all over the road. I said, well, didn't you put any weight in the truck? He said, no. Why not? Because you told me to. See, there's that rebellion, you know, that you told me to, playing mother deal. J.D. is a rose grower. He has some of the most beautiful roses, has gorgeous rose gardens. Well, he had this one little area there where the roses didn't do very well. And so he came in and he said, I've got it figured out. He says, it's the roof. The roof? He said, yeah. He says, the rain comes down on the roof and the roof, it's, it's, there's something in that and it's not doing my roses very good. I'm going to move the roses. In other words, he was going to start a new flower bed. So I said, that's it. You just wanted to start a new flower bed. Why didn't you just say you want to start a new flower bed? Who cares? And he said, no, I really think. I said, J.D., I don't believe, he said, I'm going to get me some gutters. Gutters. Yeah, we're going to have the expensive gutters now all the way around the house. And I said, J.D., that is a crock. He said, i tell you what. He says, that is going to make a difference in the rose garden. I said, I'll kiss your ass in the middle of Healy Street if that makes a difference. (laughs) And when they begin to bud... (laughs) I wanted to go out there and salt them. I, went, I really did. I wanted to go out there, you know. And so finally I came in and I told him, I said, okay, go out there and bear it and I'm ready to kiss it. And he laughed. He said, no, but it's just nice to know that you can be wrong again. <laughs> he does so love it. You have to develop a hands-off policy is what this is about. You have to learn to mind your own business. And what is your business? I thought everything that concerned anything in my world was my business. You know, not so. And when I began to do that, I began to see things differently. Chuck would have said I could see through a new pair of glasses. You know, I could see things about J.D. Like, for instance, he's so talented. He's so artistic. I just love his sculptures. He is creative. He's funny. And guess what? He can take care of himself. And you know one of the neatest things when I travel, when I come home, I do not have to come home to a dirty house. I do not have to come home to clutter. I do not have to come home to dirty dishes. I don't have to come home and do laundry. J.D. is self-supporting. You know, isn't that amazing? You know, I used to think I had to do all of that for him, you know. And he is so funny. He loves to play with people. He just loves to play with people. 
Jennifer is over at our house one afternoon, and Jennifer just lived a few blocks away. Hand up, Jennifer. <laughs> there, there. And so when she left and went home, she called back and she said, Did I have on shoes when I came to your house? And I said, I don't remember because, I mean, we're from the South. We go barefoot a lot. No big deal. And so she says, well, I just got home and I couldn't find my shoes. And so in a little bit, I happened to look up on the chandelier and I said, by the way, um, no, you did not go back with your shoes. They're here. She said, well, where were they? And I said, well, you won't believe it. But come on back. You know, and her shoes were up. He likes to play little practical jokes. <laughs> I had another girl that I sponsor, and she always carries a big, heavy purse. And it's one of those where everything goes to the bottom, you know, like a tote bag sort of. And so he was moving it from one chair to the other when we were in another room talking. And he determined it was so heavy, it was like she had rocks in it. And then the thought came to him. And he took two big pieces of asphalt, and he put it in the bottom of her purse. And she left. And she put it over her shoulder like nothing and walked out. And he's over there just going, I don't believe that. I said, what do you mean? He said that, that she's got at least five or six pounds of rocks in her purse. And she she never knew. Well, she sponsored the Alateens. And a few days later, she was talking to me and she said she was going to get the Alateens really bad the next week because somebody had put rocks in her purse. And I said, what do you mean? She said, these big chunks of asphalt like stuff are in my purse. And she said, I know the kids did it because one of them said to me, what's in here, rocks? And she says, the next day at work, a girl's looking for a safety pin. I said, don't worry about it. She emptied it out on her desk, and she said, there's these big chunks of asphalt. She says, I've been carrying them around my purse, and she'd carried it around there a couple of weeks. <laughs> That's the way he is, you know. And uh, last year on our wedding anniversary, I wasn't feeling really, really well. And so uh, one of the neighbors had brought down a huge bushel basket of turnip greens. And so I just did not feel like getting up and washing, washing, washing turnip greens and fixing turnip greens. And I'm laying there in bed, and later I'm smelling turnip greens. And J.D. had gone out there and done all that washing of those greens and was cooking turnip greens. So I know he can do hot dogs and turnip greens now. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I'm saying, you know. You see things and you see people differently. Um, in the beginning, I went over to the old Serenity house when J.D. was going through classes there. And on their blackboard, they had this, it was where they had turned the chalk sideways and made huge block letters. And it says, there's only one God today, you're not him, you know. And I saw that and I went in and I told Joe, I said, all right, I got your point, ha ha. And Joe said, what? And I said, I saw what you did. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, the deal on the blackboard about there's only one God and today you're not him. I said, I saw that, ha ha. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I, I know you're making a point to me. He said, Miracle, that's been up there for years. <laughs> you see, the ego, it's all about me, you know. All about me. But no person can meet the needs of another, not all of the needs. And so we've learned that our separateness is our mutual strength. The fact that we can work together and make something work. You know, there was a long time you could put two of us together and you don't have a, a, an adult. You know, I mean, you have a five-year-old and a six-year-old, you know. Put them together and what have you got there, you know. But our best relationship is one where dependence is mutual, independence is equal, and our obligation reciprocal. And this means that we are true partnership. We depend on one another from time to time, yet we're independent enough we can stand alone and be okay but we choose to work together and live on a give-and-take basis. That's what it's about. And that's that teamwork concept. You know, it talks about being a helpmate. And that's what it is. We help each other when we need to, but we don't when we don't, you know. We can do together what we can't do separately. And sometimes we even have fun doing it, you know. That's neat, too. Like I say, in fact, even with the musky dying adventure out in the backyard, we have had so many laughs. You know, so much, we've had fun doing the work together. And that was something we never did. J.D. said he came home one afternoon, and I was sitting out under our apple trees on in our, one of our Rondack chairs, and I had my cell phone there and a glass of iced tea and my book on my chest and was sound asleep. I had come in from work, and I just thought, you know, it would be neat to go out there and just enjoy that yard. You know, you work in it all the time, but we very have, have very little time just to go out there and enjoy. But that's the thing. We uh, put an entertainment center together. Now, that would normally be grounds for divorce anywhere. You know, we worked. I mean, the book had 50-some-odd pages of instructions 
on how to build the entertainment center, you know. And we did it. The only problem was when we got built, it was laying place down in the living room, and we weren't strong enough to lift it up. We had to call a neighbor to come help us. <laughs> but we got it built. We just weren't strong enough to move it, you know. But um, being totally dependent on another person isn't living, and it's sure not love. And if you're not careful, you can be an emotional emotional leech tied together by sickness. And we saw this in our couples meeting. We had a couple that came for several years, and then they determined that the only thing that had bound them together the years that they were together was their sickness. And when each one of them got well in the program, they decided they did not want to live together anymore, that they were there was just too much not wreckage of the past, but daily living that they did not enjoy being together, but they were able to divorce without hard feelings. Now that, to me, was a miracle. I've seen a lot of people get a divorce, and usually there's a certain amount of bitterness or rancor or whatever about it, but they even get together on holidays and, and uh, share the kids and grandkids and stuff like that, and uh, it's been it's been nice to, to watch that. Now, are you too needy in your relationship? You know, there's questions you can know. You know, if you're too needy, you have a need for questions. And those are, what's the matter? Are you okay? You know, and are you, are you, are you sure you're okay? After a little bit of that, you're not okay. Because you're irritated that they keep asking you if something's the matter. You know how that goes. And then you have the who, what, when, where, how, and why. You gotta know all that, you know. You gotta take those. You gotta beware of adverbs. They're dangerous. And not knowing isn't a bad thing. You know, in our old ad, it tells us that what you're most supposed to know, what you're meant to know, will come to you without any action on your part. You do not have to get out and hunt for it. You know, back during the drinking, I had to go looking, search, search, seize, destroy. You know, that was the thing. Search them out, seize them, and then destroy them if you possibly could. If not, wreck the bar. You know, whatever. Those places that were keeping them away from home. Okay? But the questions are actions. You know? What you're meant to know without any action on your part. You don't have to ask the questions.